Hi, I'm Ann Campbell, and today I'm going to talk about the key features of SonarCube 10.1. Now, we've got a lot of new rules for you in this version, so I've put it in kind of a condensed format this time. Let's start with C Sharp. So in C Sharp, we have new performance-related rules for collections and one new rule to encourage the use of string.create. Also for C Sharp, some existing rules get smarter, so we added support for C Sharp 9 through 11 for null tracking and calculation overflow detection. We've also added general performance improvements for rule S3260. In Kotlin, we've got a set of new rules for code redundancy and another set of new rules for writing idiomatic Kotlin code. These rules are aimed at Java developers who are switching over to Kotlin, and the idea here is to help you write more Kotlin-y Kotlin. We've also added support for Kotlin multi-platform. In Java, we've got three new architecture rules, support for Java 20, and the ability to enable support for JDK preview features. In Python, we've got a set of new rules for regular expressions, plus improvements to the underlying regular expression parser, and improvements to the existing regular expression rule S6353. We've also got a set of new rules for type hints, a set of new rules for Django, and we've added Zonarlint quick fixes to three regex rules and one Django rule. For TypeScript, we've got better support for core features with a slew of new rules and updates to a number of existing rules. Also for TypeScript, we've given you better out-of-the-box analysis. This means that in most situations, analysis now should just work without a lot of extra configuration. We've also added support for TypeScript 5. And in Java and Python, there's now better bug detection with basic arithmetic and logical operators. Plus, Python now gets the import of MyPy reports. Terraform, we import tflint reports. And for Docker, we import hadolint reports. And for C and C++, we now support multiple code variants. Now, this is something y'all have been waiting for for a long time. We knew we needed to do it, but it was a tough nut to crack. Well, we finally cracked it. For those of you who are not C, C++ developers, what we're talking about here is when you use preprocessor commands to change what ends up in the final compile. You use this when, for instance, you want to use the same code base on both Windows and Linux. Now, previously, our answer for this was unsatisfactory. Um, the options were to analyze each variant as a separate project, but of course, that, up, that ate up your license. Um, the other option was to analyze each variant as a different branch of the same project, um, but you still had the problem there that it was very difficult to track issues across variants. So for any given issue, does this show up in one variant, all variants, some variants, and which ones? So that's what we've addressed in 10.1, and I want to show you what that looks like in the UI. So here we are in a project with multiple variants, and you see in the issues list, I see for each issue the number of variants that it shows up in. And when I mouse over that, I see which variants those are. I also see that in the issue detail. So I've got my variant count and the identity of those variants. And of course, you're probably noticing uh, that the UI here is a little bit different. We have actually updated the entire project space in 10.1 for the fancy new. We have out. We have actually updated the entire project space in 10.1 with a nice new UI. So all of the pages and projects, uh, the overview, the issues you just saw, measures, etc. Now there's still more work to be done in this area. Look for that in future versions. Another thing that we've updated is the presentation of rule descriptions. So previously, this tabbed format was available only for vulnerability rules. In 10.1, we've extended that to all of the rules. So you'll see it broken out to why is this an issue, how can I fix it, more info, and so on. Not all of the rules have this data in place yet. We're working on that. Watch this space. Now, speaking of continuous improvement, I want to talk a little bit about our security detection. So 
Uh, here we are at a copy of an internal spreadsheet where we've been tracking the progress of our security detection. One of our goals as a company this year is to improve our security detection against multiple languages. And we've decided to measure that by using the major benchmarks for those languages. So we've been working on this all year. We started by identifying the benchmarks we want to use, then getting the baseline against those benchmarks, and then we um, measure improve, repeat. So I just want to give you a quick scroll through time here. We started out against OWASP benchmark with a true positive rate of approximately 77%, um, a false detection rate of almost half. So let's just do a quick scroll here and as the days and weeks go by we see that we start to see some improvement until we get to what we've just delivered in 10.1 which is an almost 93 3% uh, true positive rate for the OS benchmark and down to just over 1% false detection rate. We're at 88% for WebGoat, 98% for Security Shepherd. We're really proud of those numbers, but we do have more work we want to do in this space uh, as represented by these orange lines down here. So we will be continuing to work on this in Java and other languages. Look for more in, next, in, in subsequent versions. So I want to come back to the interface here to a new page that we've added in this version. You'll find it under More in the global menu. This is the Clean As You Code page. Um, Clean As You Code is something that we believe deeply in. We've been talking about this for years. But until now, we've never taken the time to give you the tools to show the value of Clean As You Code to your team. So that's what this is. Um, this is this graph is showing me that if we had strictly adopted Clean As You Code 10 years ago, uh, we would have 316 fewer bugs and vulnerabilities across all the code bases in this instance today. Now, the underlying premise here is that if you make sure that the code that you commit today is clean, so all the code you've added, all the code you've changed has no new bugs in it, no new vulnerabilities, gradually over time, the code base will get be cleaned up automatically with no extra effort. Now, that's kind of abstract. Um, it's great in theory, but it has been difficult to really prove to people, which is why I was so excited to hear about a project that someone put out there called the Git of Theseus. Uh, so what the Git of Theseus does is you point it at your repository and it will analyze your code base and show how much of the code from a given, in this case, year, still exists in your code base today. So this is SonarCube itself. This is the Git of Theseus of SonarCube itself. Um, the code base does go back further than uh, 2010, but this is just when we started the graph. So of the almost 400,000 lines of code in the code base in 2010, Look at what a tiny, tiny fraction of that is left in the code base today in 2023. So imagine that if right here where the red stops, so at the beginning of 2011, we had said, that's it, no more new bugs, no more vulnerabilities. We, we have some in existing code, we're just gonna let that lie until we touch that code. But for all of the code that we add or change from today, no more new bugs and vulnerabilities, imagine, all of these other colors would be pristine. The vast bulk of the code base would be free of bugs and vulnerabilities. That is the blessing, the promise of Clean As You Code. This is why we feel so strongly about it and why you're going to see us in this version and in subsequent versions giving you more tools to better use Clean As You Code um, and better explain Clean As You Code to, and better apply clean as you code to bring along your teammates, your managers, your neighbors, whoever needs convincing, um, because the benefit is real. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. I'm going to go back to the UI again. Here we are. This is one of the things that we've changed in this version around clean as you code. So previously in the new code definition, you had the ability to set an arbitrary number of days as your new code definition. So I could set my new code definition as 3,000 days. Now, obviously, that's not really a good 
new code definition. I might as well not have a new code definition if I'm going to set it so arbitrarily high. And that's why we've put some um, bumpers around that in this version. So it defaults to 30, but let's just let's just try it. Let's set this to 3000. And now the interface is telling me, okay, that doesn't make sense as a new code definition. Um, please set it to something a little bit more reasonable. And here we see that the limit is 90. So if I set, now I can save this. And so I've just set the global value as 90. That's the global default. This also applies at the project level. Uh, you're going to have the same limits there. And finally, in commercial editions, I want to talk about user group synchronization. So in previous versions, we added this for Okta SAML so that when you create a user in Okta, it shows up in SonarCube. When you delete a user in Okta, it's removed from SonarCube. We've done the same thing in this version for GitHub. So now if you create a user, move the user from one group to another, etc., that's automatically going to be pulled from GitHub into SonarCube without further intervention on your part. All you need to do is set up your GitHub application and then configure that into SonarCube and you get this automatic synchronization. And that's what I wanted to show you today. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.